We are the first permitted single household gray water system in Sonoma County. So you are doing not just a gray water system, you're pioneering getting it through your agencies. Yeah, doing our best, you know, and that thing of like your small acts can make a big difference. And we taught a workshop here where we had officials from county permits and gray water gorillas and engineers and architects. And so just having one example um, can have mm -hmm. many significant ripples. This is Peak Moment. We are living at a peak of human innovation, information, wealth, and health. But we're also at a peak of population and consumption, with rising temperatures and declining resources fueled by cheap oil and gas. Peak Moment Television, bringing you examples of positive responses to energy decline and climate change through local community action. Hi, welcome to Peak Moment. I'm Jenea Donaldson. I'm in a suburban neighborhood in Petaluma, California, and my guest is Trayton Heckman, who is Executive Director of Daily Acts and Green Sangha. Thanks for joining me. You're having us here. It's my pleasure. Trayton, you have the most amazing yard. I bet you have people coming up and asking you about this. Tell me about it. It's definitely a pretty rich experience. We do, uh, I do a lot of sustainability education, and I think this garden is one of the best ways to educate people. I sit there in my office window and look out and 50 to 100 people a week, yeah. cars stop, people come across the street just to say your garden makes me really happy. We share a lot of food with neighbors and strangers mm. and friends. And uh, you know really we just wanted to create a lush and a productive and a resilient mm -hmm. ecosystem, not just plant a garden, but plant an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and use, you know, do that by transforming waste streams like coffee grounds and wood chips and local horse manure, um, things like that. And you know, just create a beautiful garden that feeds us and feeds neighbors and friends. You've got herbs, you've got medicinal plants, you've got vegetables. Yeah. So it's, it's wonderful. Yep. And you said trees. Yeah, we've planted about, there's about 60 varieties of food and medicinal plants growing right here bringing in beneficial insects, fixing nitrogen and nutrients. We planted about 25 fruit trees in the front, um, which you can't even barely tell. You look around and it just looks like a garden. But yeah. there's a, a 10 tree living apple fence along this fence. There's four types of citrus lining the house. There's five trees in the median. Uh, and they're dwarf and semi-dwarf and multi-graft trees. So in a small lot, you could actually get a diversity of yields. Nice, yeah. nice. Well, we could do a whole fabulous show on what you're doing here, yeah. and you're not the only one. You're, you're, this is a part of a network, is that right? True, yeah. You know, so rather than just kind of grow food for us and our neighbors and friends, we're really creating this household as a model, and there's a network of people. There's people all over the country and all over the world who are doing this, but in yeah. this community, we have about a dozen households that are working at growing more food and having more habitat and having bees and chickens and ducks and gray water, rainwater catchment and things. And with the intent to again, make our households more self-reliant, but also to create a model for other people and to learn how to reintegrate as community. Not everybody needs um, a honey processor or an apple press. Uh -huh. um, we share seedlings and starts. We share waste streams. I don't have you know, we get too many snails, and we don't have chickens and ducks yet, so we feed our snails to our friends' chickens, and they give us eggs. Nice. You know, that's, so I mean, that's a reciprocity that you're, you're doing. Exactly. Well, Trayson, what I'd like to do is we want to look at your gray water system. That's mm -hmm. our main purpose for being here. So why don't we start with first go inside and tell us what's gray water? Well, tell me now, what's gray water? Gray water, you know, depending on which state you're in, how it's defined, in California, it's your bathroom sink, your shower, your laundry sink, and laundry. Uh, in some states, kitchen sink is considered gray water, and dishwasher in California, it's not. Okay. So. Why don't we start our tour of your gray water system at the source? Sure. That okay. sounds great. I'll follow you. How much water do we end up using? It's an insane amount of water. Um, you know, UNESCO says the average person on the planet for health needs five to ten gallons of water a day. Depending on what numbers you look at, the average American uses about a hundred gallons of water a day. And that's not counting our agriculture, industrial processes, wow. which takes it over a thousand. Uh, and so our, our, our consumption of this just incredibly precious resource is, um, is really high and off the charts. People are thinking that, this, I mean, it already is becoming a problem, getting enough fresh water for everybody. 
It's huge. You know, California just had its driest record, driest spring in 114 years of record keeping. Um, climate change, there's going to be more issues with our water. Most of our water comes from the Sierras. Right. Right. The West is drying, so water, getting to really treasure it for the, the life-giving resource that it is. So how do you treasure it? You know, just changing our relationship with it rather than, you know, our water, our energy, our garbage, all these things that just go away. Where is away versus, you know, one sharing, right? It's like carpooling. You put two people in the car, you double your efficiency. You take a bath with a friend, you double your efficiency. <laughs> and when you pull that plug, does it just then go mix with your black water and use a lot of electricity to get taken to a wastewater treatment pump somewhere, plant? Or um, can it do something else? Can it do something amazing while you develop a healthy relationship with your life, your home, your garden as a living system. So you use your gray water for your gardens. Exactly. Well, let's go see. That sounds great. All right, pop the plug and let's go see where that water goes. So when you pull the plug, rather than it going mysteriously away, why not have it come out the back of your house and feed your garden ecosystem? So what plumbing did you have to do to make that happen? So what we did, there's multiple ways to do a gray water system, but for this system, we replumbed under our house to bring the bath or the bath or shower water, bathroom sink, laundry sink and laundry. All those come into one pipe, okay. which then comes out of the house right here. Mhm. Mm and it enters the garden. A really important aspect of the system is something called a Jandy valve. And so this is the only one, the only people that make it. It's a three-way valve. And what this enables you to do is to either turn the valve and it, the gray water could go to your garden or you could turn it back to the city sewer water. So for some reason you want to shut down your system or you need to do some maintenance on it or you know in the winter if there's too much water and you know you get okay. a big storm or something just flooded or whatever yeah so you, you could go back. for us we would have to go into the house people have these more ideally located you could have it just right here a little mm -hmm. jandy valve mm -hmm. depends on mm -hmm. how you did the plumbing and so you just turn the valve and then all the gray water would head back to the sewer pipe just like as it, has it did been before doing. okay exactly okay great well let's follow the pipes to see where it goes into your garden the magical mystery gray water tour <laughs> So once the gray water enters the garden, the path it follows is the pipe comes along behind this rose bush, right along the edge of the sidewalk, and it enters our constructed wetlands. The first stop in the process is, and I'll just put a little disclaimer that I'm going to explain our system, which is a gray water system with a constructed wetland, but a constructed wetland is not required for a gray water system. Okay. So after I run through how the system functions, I'll mention that without this wetland piece, you could just do the second part of just entering the gray water. Okay. And so, and also explain more of why a wetland. And so the water enters this little mulch basin, which is, this is basically just a Whole Foods grocery basket with yeah. a hole in it. And this wood chips just acts as a pre-filter for any kind of gum or gunk that's in your bath water or your laundry water. Yeah, I saw a little bit of soap exactly. curds or something like that that yeah. just fell through. Just so that doesn't enter the wetland rocks. And so what this wetland is essentially, um, wetlands are extremely amazing, biologically rich um, water purification systems. They do a lot of other great things. And so this is a 20 foot long trench that's four foot wide and about two and a half, three foot deep and it's filled with a pond liner. So there's actually a full body of water mm -hmm. in here. And then really? it's filled with gravel and three quarter inch drain rock. And so the water will never come above the surface of the rock the way the piping system set up because that's a key thing with gray water. You always need to keep it subsurface. So the water comes into the basket, gets filtered by the, the wood chips, and then the water just keeps going because it's an open basket in, in, into a, an, exactly. under, it's an underground pond. Yes, and it's gravity fed. And so the purpose of the drain of the pea gravel is that there's an enormous amount of surface area which is home for bacterium. And so you know you have water which has um, people would say pollution in it or basically nutrients. And so for the bacterium, the nutrient in the water is food. And so there's a lot of surface area for the bacterium to live, and they eat the nutrients in the water. And the plants also help do that as well. Um, 
there are certain types of wetland plants which naturally purify water, and so they sort of polish off the water and clean it up. So these are cleaners, if yes. you will. They're, they eat up anything that's there in the water, and in a sense, they, by purifying it, they've made it safe to use in your garden. Exactly. This is really, food. I mean, technically, the engineer who designed the system said the wetland could treat black water. So as far as for a gray water system, this is way above and beyond. Um, and you know, you'd want to consider doing this because it's a lot of extra embodied energy and time and expense. And for us, the reason we wanted to do it is twofold. One, we wanted to create a permitted system so it's safe, ecological, and legal um, because it's a really ripe moment for us to engage and change policy so people could use their wastewater. And there was a, a, per, a system permitted in Berkeley. And so by having a system that was already, already permitted with gray water and wetland, uh. it was easier for us to go to our local building official um, and say, well, here's a permitted system. We have it engineered. And so it enabled us to um, get it permitted more effectively to get these out there. Because there was a precedent that included. Exactly. A, it was a an easier a leap. I see. And then for us, part two is that we want to include a pond which is a larger legal jump to have gray water go into an open body of water, but so to have a wetland feed a pond that will have ducks in it, um, you need to have clean water. I see. Because the oil is in their feathers and things. So you're doing this step because you had a pre legal precedent and because this is a next step to another thing that you want to create, your exactly. open pond, a real pond. And this is still early in it. The gray water system and the wetland are functioning, though as you could tell, we haven't planted a lot of the wetland mm -hmm. plants yet. Mm -hmm. So our property slopes back, I think around 2%. And so gravity, basically, when water comes in the system, it moves through this wetland with the palm liner. And at the bottom of this basin, there's a three inch pipe with holes in it. And so by gravity, the water goes through those holes and it comes up through this pipe, which then heads out into what is technically the gray water system. So this, this, this cap, it doesn't go out the top of that. It's going through the, the perforated stuff is letting water in. In. In, and then from above that is coming out into here? Yes, it comes out through here into this, which is the type of gray water system we have is called a branched drain system. And so there's three branches that head out into different parts of the garden. Um, it's one and a half inch pipe. And as you can see, there's three valves. And so if you want, you can leave all three open and then it will, water will enter by gravity into all three of the branches. Or if you want to feed water into one and not the other two, you could just close two valves. Um, and the pipes are all at, again, a 2% slope. So, so you've got gravity, gravity is feeding water. that water down. Exactly. And so one could actually, if one doesn't have a wetlands, one could actually have this kind of system straight out of the house. Exactly. Is that right? Going to, to where you want it to go to. Yes, that's okay. one type of system. And it's a popular system um, in Art Ludwig's Creating Oasis with Gray Water, which is sort of the Bible for gray water. Creating an oasis with gray with water. Gray water. Yes. With Art Ludwig. Art All Ludwig. Right. Okay. Um, great web resources as well at his site. And so he speaks to, um, they're a little more work to set up initially, but there's some simpler gray water systems where you're always having to move a hose around from tree to tree to tree, mm. versus this, automatically, you have a distribution system that's just in place. You put it in once, and then it goes to different aspects of your garden. So it saves you time later. Exactly. So, Trayton, where do these go? To wonderful places. Let's follow <laughs> one of the branches. So, just below my feet is a one and a half inch pipe an ABS pipe, if you follow my path, and it distributes to a mulch basin here. A mulch basin, now what is that? So this is, as you can see, it's doubling. It's our gray water distribution system, and this is a pathway that we walk on in the garden because it's a small urban lot. And so essentially the pipe comes, and there's three branches, and it drops out into, the, I'll show you one in a moment, but a five gallon bucket with a hole cut in it, and the pipe enters into the bucket. And that's just so if you need to, you could dig it up and you could access the pipe end. So I, this does feel more squishy. So you've got, about how deep is, is this? So just below in this space right here, if you could visualize uh, this entire pathway, about two and a half feet wide, mm -hmm. a little over two foot deep, and about 20 foot long, essentially about 50 square foot of soil was removed. Wow. So we had this big trench here. Um, we then put in six 
little basins where the gray water drops out and we filled it with mulch. And so under our feet, it's not earth, it's just, it's just a deep a, mulch bed. And the mulch is made out of sort of wood chips and needles and Recycled needles and stuff. wood chips from Sonoma compost. Oh. Um, so which is nice, it's you know, a, a good it. reuse. Right. And it'll break down and become good soil. So what did you do with all the dirt? I mean, you had dirt in your wetlands, wetlands that you had to pull out. You had a lot of dirt here. Where did that go? It was a lot of earth. You did a lot of... A lot of moving, moving? a lot of help, too. Really? Yeah, and so, you know, not wanting to take things away, right, to use the resources. Right. So we probably had about 15 yards of soil that we just had to redistribute around the property. So there's was a lot of work figuring out where it all goes. Maybe that's where the potato mounds came from, right? Exactly, the, right. the potato mounds in the driveway right. are a chunk right. of the soil. And so we just did that. We distributed all over the yard oh. um, to grow food. But it's definitely, and we still have, you know, in the back of the property, we had some space that wasn't being used yet, so I made two giant tomato beds. And so we're still moving the soil around. But yeah, you know, to, to keep the soil on site. Right. So let me show me what the, you know, if you can, the bucket. Sure. Thing, yeah? Sure. So walking under our feet, again, is this big mulch basin where gray water is dropping out into. And where we just walked, there's two branches of the three of the gray water system. Actually, I have a question for you right yes. here. Why did you choose to put your, your trench here, your gray water here, instead of, say, against the fence or somewhere else? Because we were doing this as a legal system, whereas a lot of um, ecological and safe systems are done illegally, because where we're at with code right now, um, we were wanting to help try and shift policy. And so we're following the rules. And one of those mm -hmm. rules is a five foot property line setback. Oh. And so for our purposes, you know, for an ecological garden, we want to grow things more on the edges where we grow our taller fruit trees and berry bushes and things. She'd love to have that gray water going into exactly. the Exactly. And so we put it as close as we could to the property line. So then it would feed the roots of these rose bushes, this Asian pear tree, the, um, persimmon that we are the pomegranate we just put in mm -hmm. and so aiming for you know making it not just burying the gray water which is all code wants you to do but to have it be usable for us to grow food and shade and habitat mm -hmm. and be legal and be legal okay great well now show me show me what what's buried under here sure under our magic mulch path so those were two branches feeding this section the third branch, if you imagine just below our feet, is a one and a half inch ABS pipe that then comes out to another 25 square foot mulch basin, which I'm standing on right now, mm -hmm. which again is about mm -hmm. 10 foot, 10 to 12 foot long, That's two it. and a half foot wide, about two foot deep. And so this is what, when I was mentioning the five gallon bucket, essentially uh, this is a five gallon bucket with the bottom obviously has, you know, it's just down to the earth and has a hole cut in the top and there's a hole cut in the side where the pipe from the gray water enters the bucket and the water drops off here. So if you need to, you can look at your system, you can reach down and adjust the pipe. Um, and so this is buried under that path. So if I need to as well, I could go and dig up any of these and sort of pretty easily access the system to see if things need to be cleaned out or tuned. You've, you've placed this then, both to be legal and for something else that you're going to put in to water here. Exactly. Now, is, is it because you are going to have things whose roots are going to be deep enough to be able to access this water? Because this is below ground level. Definitely. And so that's one of the things as far as how we had to design the system with our property and code. Um, there's more ideal ways to get gray water directly to the roots of a tree. Um, but based upon the constraints of the system, we had to have it go down, you know, for gravity slope to get down, as you could see, about two feet. And so what mm -hmm. we're going to do is, mm -hmm. where this mulch pile and compost is right behind me, dig down to that same level and plant some perennials and berry bushes. Okay. Um, so, you know, really do our best to get roots right to the things that we want growing there. And some, you know, it'll take more time. We're going to plant probably a mulberry tree right behind me as well. And so it'll take a few years, but eventually the roots will get down to where the water is um, and be able to access it more easily. Great, great. Well, I have a few more last little questions. I want to ask sort of other parts of this. So sure. let's go find a seat and that sounds great. wrap up. Trathan, thanks for the great tour, because that, even though it's almost all underground, it's just really nice to sort of picture what all is happening in actually a fairly small space in yeah. your backyard. So I want to kind of fill in with the details from you on
Let's go back to step one. You, you, you learned about gray water systems. You, you contacted, you knew somebody who had engineered one. You knew of one happening in Berkeley. Then what? Start the moving for you. What did you do? Um, you know, so after that original desire just to use this amazing resource and then connecting with the different relationships of just presenting that to local officials who, you know, we assumed had the authority to make these decisions, um, having a body work, and it's a ripe time right now. There's code that's inhibitive but there's a lot of interest um, in getting these sort of systems through and so while it does take a little bit of work um, people are open and receptive and so just connecting with local officials to find out what are your your code r rules who are the authorities that you need to connect with and so once we had the engineer an example of a system and a draft of a system designed you know we connect with our local building officials so your building the department city of Petaluma. okay um, and then from there, you know, the process was started and they looked at the plans and they moved it around to the various departments, the water department and different people to see if it, you know, made yeah. sense. We did a percolation test, which is a really important aspect of it, to make sure your soil has the appropriate drainage. So you had to hire, did you have to hire somebody to do a, an official percolation test report? We did, but the engineer who's wanting to design more of these systems donated his time and services to do that work. We did an initial, there was an opening of the permitting process. At that point, we had big trenches dug and piping everywhere and soil everywhere. And we had to do something which was, I'm trying to think of the name, it was called a, a 10 foot head test, where we had to connect a pipe to the system and fill it with water. And it had to sit there um, to make sure there was no leaks in the system. Oh. So the water was getting to where the design said it needed to go. Okay. And so then they came out and the building official gave an initial sign off on that. And then when we finished the system and cleaned the piles of gravel out of the street and did all <laughs> those sort of things, they came back and did a final sign off. How much did this whole system cost, which probably gets into what labor did you have to pay for? What equipment, uh, hardware did you have to pay for? And so it's widely variable um, in how you do it. Most people do this with friends and family and things. Um, we had, so the, the wetland was a large amount of the expense, which again isn't required for a gray water system, um, you know, because the palm liner and the gravel. Overall, everything that we did as a process was about $4,000. But there were things included in that, like restructuring our plumbing under the house, which isn't necessarily just about gray waters because we had bad plumbing. Okay. So, you know, it's sort of where and you draw the line. does that include the price of your wetlands as well? It does. The wetland was, so really just for the gray water system alone, you know, probably less than $1,000. You add in the plumbing of the pipes, you add in the $1,000 or so for gravel, pond liner, um, different elements mm -hmm. of that. Um, the Jandy valves were donated by Herb, Herb's Pool Supply. A lot of the plumbing work was donated by Boyle Plumbing. Epic Design Build, some friends came and donated a lot of the service for putting it in. So it's really like a, a barn or a bale raising. You know, it was a community effort of a lot of people came together um, just to make it happen. So great support from the city of Petaluma. Um, Ferguson Supplies donated a lot of the piping. So there was, uh, you know, a significant amount of So it took the whole support. community, the whole village built your, gr your sure. gray water system. Without a doubt. It <laughs> definitely wasn't me. <laughs> so it didn't, um, do you think that every system needs to be, you need to have an engineer design out the system? Is that required, you think? You know, that's a, a big question where I think it's more just people engaging in the process. Um, there's some very legitimate concerns that public health officials have about contaminating the groundwater and different things, um, but you know, also looking at, I think we're overly fearful of gray water because it's new for a lot of people, but we trust people to raise kids and we trust people to drive around 2,000 pound boxes of metal um, that we need to trust them with our gray water. Um, and so figuring out a way that doesn't inhibit systems put in because tens of thousands of gallons of water in every single house in your community going to the curb and going away and using a lot of energy to do so versus using it to grow food and grow medicine and grow habitat and sequester global warming emissions. Um, it, it's an important edge, so there's not a, a simple answer with it, but mm -hmm. we need mm -hmm. simple, safe, ecological, and legal systems, ideally, and that's just important for people to engage and engage our public officials and say, yes, we have public health concerns about this, but we're in a drought and we're running out of water with global warming and things, and so we need to engage all risks and just get together and, and listen to each other, you know, and move forward. So if you were going to give your, your 
advice mm -hmm. to someone watching this who says, okay, I understand, I got a sense of your gray water system, what advice would you give them to, to do theirs, to think of doing theirs? You know, first, like really conserve every drop of water you can. Mm -hmm. For years, as I know you mentioned, the easiest gray water system, I've been carrying buckets of water from our kitchen sink or your bathtub out into the garden and putting a few gallons at a time into mulched plants. And so, you know, using less water, doing simple systems, um, you know, and just asking those questions of how can I, instead of seeing something as a problem to go away, how can this be a vital resource to build the fertility of our lives and our gardens? And so, you know, getting educated, um, finding out what other systems, there's a lot of resources on gray water nowadays. It's a, it's a very hot topic. And so there's great little videos on the web, um, some amazing books, Create an Oasis with Gray Water by mm -hmm. Art Ludwig. Gaia's Garden, a home-scale permaculture book, has a description of a gray water system and a gray water wetland system. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Brad Lancaster has amazing books on um, drylands rainwater harvesting, which has rainwater and gray water. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really good resources out there in hard copy, on the web. There's a lot of workshops. You know, the smell it, touch it, taste it, hands-on piece is important for people to learn. And to not be afraid, just to engage without having all the answers or all, having all the skills. You mean you don't have to know it all before you begin? Shockingly. <laughs> <laughs> it works out like that. I think it's better not to. A richer process. So, anything else that we I've forgotten to ask? Just, you, um, you know, largely, again, emphasizing just people to engage. Like, water gives life, and there's a lot of change in our lives, and we have to radically reduce our resource consumption. But it doesn't mean we can't have lush, productive, resilient lives and gardens and communities. And it's just a ripe moment. Um, so much has come out of this. We've learned a lot. There's still a lot more to learn. Building community. Other people are putting in gray water systems. We've gotten a ton of media. And so every person that goes out engages. Um, it's your small example in your neighborhood, but it's a part of a, a much larger significant shift right now. Uh, so just engage in the process and look around at the resource and the relationships you have, you know, sometimes unexpected allies. Thank you. Thank you for the tour, the advice. Thank you for pioneering those edges. And um, may this help your ripples of influence multiply all the more. May we gray water our planet. <laughs> yeah, definitely ready for, for more, you know, good Thank systems you. and people engaging. Thank you. You're watching Peak Moment, Community Responses to a Changing Energy Future. My guest is Trayson Heckman, Petaluma, California, permaculturist and his very fine gray water system. Join us again. <laughs>